Well, through high school, I was playing music part-time. I was playing in local clubs, and that was making my spending money. And I have to admit, probably in the latter part of high school, uh, I, in grade 13, you know, some older people in the audience will remember that Ontario had grade 13. Um, I was skipping school and attending first year McMaster courses. I was more interested in what they were doing, or I thought I was more interested in what they were doing in university. I thought, oh, all these books I'm reading, they're going to get into the meat of them. This will be fun. And they weren't. So I ended up spending half my time at the library going through books about folk singers, especially David Garr's, uh, the photographer David Garr, who is really well known. Some of the iconic photographs from the, from the 60s and early 70s and, uh, were all taken by him. And there were books of his work, so I'm flipping through and just dreaming about becoming a folk singer. And actually, in one of them, I saw a picture of one of the, one of the uh, guitarists and members of The Birds, Roger McGinn. He was in there, and under the caption, and by the way, The Birds record, or one of The Birds records, was the first album I ever bought in my life with my own money, right? The Birds' Fifth Dimension. And sidebar to that, uh, that record had two traditional ballads on it. I had no idea what trad or public domain meant at the end of a song, if I even paid attention. But I remember hearing these two songs and being completely knocked out. I'd never heard melodies or stories in songs like that, ever. And I, even though I had bought it for their version of Mr. Tambourine Man, these songs became my favorites, and I learned that they were they were child ballads. They were original ballads, and they did their versions. One was a broken token song, you know, of lovers splitting up and getting back together. The stories were riveting and dramatic and fantastic melodies. I got hooked on traditional music starting at that moment from the birds. But also, and one day I really would love to tell Roger McGinn about this, there was a caption, you know, this is going to be your whole film, right? This one question, right? A caption under Roger McGinn's photograph of he studied at the Old Town School of Folk Music in Chicago. So I thought, that's where I want to go. I went to my guidance counselor at high school, in high school and I said, this is where I want to go. So she's looking in her big, thick uh, listing of post-secondary education. She couldn't find Old Town School of Folk Music anywhere. Right? So I wrote a letter to the Old Town School of Folk Music, Chicago. USA. I found out years later, it's a whole other story, it got there. And they wrote back and then they explained to me that they were just like a folklore center. They taught lessons and things, you know, they're still a going entity and they've built a gorgeous new building in Chicago. But I didn't know, you know, I thought it was a post-secondary education. It sounded like my kind of school. Right? And so I was bored and also playing music. And obviously there was something inside me that was driving me to be some, uh, some creative pursuit. And then where the naivete comes in is that as a teenager, as a 17 year old, you know, I thought, you know, I'm not gonna starve. I'll figure it out. And it's just as plain as that. And then you just take a leap. Now it freaked my parents out, of course, right? And they insisted that I promise that if whatever I'm pursuing didn't work out, I'd come back and finish university. Now, I also had an interest in architecture and maybe if my life had gone a different way, that would have been the track I followed. And I still have an interest that way. And astronomy, things like that are still fascinating for me and I do my own reading. I read about physics and I always uh, look at what uh, architects are doing and how they're structuring a building and I just find it interesting stuff, you know? And who knows which way your life might have gone, you know, if it wasn't for Folk music. It's all because of folk music. My life is ruined. Oh my God. I mean, to spend a life surrounded, you know, by people in, the, in following creative lifestyles. I mean, to be honest, I just find you get a high percentage of wonderful human beings. Caring, thoughtful, interesting people to spend a life with. My wife and I always say, we know so many great people. And it's, it just fills you to do that. Um, well, I, uh, as a teenager, I had heard about the Fiddler's Green Folk Club, which is what it was, a club that ran for over 20 years. And um, uh, 
they allowed guest sets. They ran two nights a week in those days, Tuesdays and Fridays, and each night there were um, up to four guest set spots where you could do three songs each or 15 minutes. And all I had to do was call and book. They didn't care. And the point was to give new people a chance. So I came and I did a couple of guest sets and because I was starting to get into American traditional music, first uh, mostly with Pete Seeger and the Weavers, records that my older sister had left behind when she went off to university and I discovered, you know, the Weavers Carnegie Hall uh, that famous record of their concert at Carnegie Hall in 1955 or something. I learned almost every song off that record and Pete Seeger's We Shall Overcome. So I was getting to know, I learned about American music and American traditional music. And I started playing banjo and dulcimer and, uh, and guitar and I started writing songs and some of them were humorous. And so I was doing these guest sets and I appealed to Tam Kearney, one of the guys running the club, you know, because of the mixed repertoire and all that. And, uh, and he said, why don't you come along and, and maybe uh, we could use somebody playing guitar and in this loose bunch of people that were, were calling ourselves the friends of Fiddler's Green. Because a bunch of singers who were going to some other clubs, kind of as outreach and, and all getting on stage together and swapping songs. And they were the friends of the club, Fiddler's Green. And so I started coming along and they were mostly British, you know, English and Scots mostly. And so they were doing traditional songs or songs written by people who were writing in those genres. And, and while I came along to play guitar, they started playing a dance tune, a fiddle tune from the British Isles. And they realized, hey, you know, I pl could play mandolin, one of them said, and I could, you know, I'm starting to learn concertina. We all know this tune. Let's play a tune together in between some of the songs. And I had no idea about these tunes. I, I, I couldn't get a sense of the A, A, B, uh, 16 bar structure of these things, you know? So I was frantically trying to figure out where one part ended and started, and I was giving them nicknames in my head to guide me. Uh, this one's called hesitation, because there's a stop between the A part and the B part. And that'll, that means I've got to stop playing the guitar for a second, you know? I was coming up with all these things, trying to figure out what to do. And, um, and I would hang out with them. So I'd go with them to gigs and I became part of the band that loosely. And the band figured out it could play tunes and started to get better at it. And then tunes became part of the, in between the songs. But still to this day, when the friends play, it's like a sing around of all the members interspersed with music. And it's just, we all, we'll all play on each other's songs when it was suitable or you know, we'll rehearse a bit and say, I've got this song and I think it would really suit guitar and fiddle and maybe if you want to come in midway through in concertina, see if we'll take a break and do an instrumental part. It's that loose. And uh, so I was 18 when that happened and uh, when, when they kidnapped me. So that's what happened. I just, just got involved with them and got caught up and that got me interested in British traditional music. And then I started learning the pipes and concertina and tin whistle. And I started, you know, I couldn't stop. I was getting interested in all this stuff. And really, I was captured by the beauty of the music. It's just that. It's not because philosophically, it's very important to keep traditional music going on. Nothing like that. It was just a brilliant music. The melodies were stunning. The stories were riveting. They were blood and guts and life and death that you couldn't help but relate to. They were dramatic. They were, they were brilliant three-act plays, you know, in song. And so much of it was because they'd been honed from being passed by mouth to mouth. And the lyrics were fine-tuned and the melodies were fine-tuned until you had these beautiful diamonds of things. And it was because they were such great music. That's why I got caught by it. The music was beautiful and stunning. I'm not just a, a little, you know, uh, just one nobody human being knocked around by whatever politicians want to do or whatever other people want to do. I can actually affect my life and other people's lives. And it started for me when I was 20 years old, when I, um, out of frustration, I had a tariff item uh, put on, on the books, on the government books, a federal tariff item. Guitar makers and instrument makers were bringing in materials that couldn't, weren't available in Canada, but high duties were put on them. And I got so frustrated clearing stuff through customs that I started, you know, asking questions and climbing my way to the top 
basically saying, what industry is this protecting? Nobody makes this here. You know, why is there 15% duty on this stuff? You know, it's crazy. The higher I got until I got to the federal government level, people got nicer and nicer until finally at the top level they said, oh, you're right, that makes sense. Here's what we'd like you to do. You tell us how many people use this stuff and what you do with it, and we'll get an order in council. We'll change it. So I did. It took a while, but I got people together, you know, and I gave them the stats. And two years later, all these things that we used to brought in came in duty free. This is before free trade. I still remember it 59825 1, which is what it was called at the time. And then it got expanded to include mandolin and banjo parts and all this stuff. And I, that was the first time. I was 20 years old, and I realized you can do things. You don't have to just sit back and take it. Oh, I love a righteous battle. I really do, you know? Maybe if I was a lawyer, if I could stand the minutia of being a lawyer, I would love to be a courtroom lawyer, you know, or something like that to fight, you know? Um, and I, you know, um, there's the belief in the importance of social justice and, and those kinds of causes, and that you should pay attention to the world you're in. And I feel this viscerally, that a purpose of being is to leave the world a better place than you found it. And I think about that in a conscious way most days. It's not a vague concept. I really think about it. And so I've chosen my world, which is craft, music, you know, and support that community and play a role in helping other people's lives is, is a way you can do in addition to just giving to charity or something that's at a remove. But this one takes my time, it takes my money, it takes my effort. But the pleasures of, of participating in this community far outweigh at the same time as it satisfies something that I've decided for myself is my goal in life. Is literally to leave the world a better place than I found it. Persistence Staying the course is what will accomplish things. And it's not just the music and craft world. Think of how many filmmakers tell you that it took eight years to get this script into production. But because they believed in it, now maybe they did some other things in the interim to pay the bills, but they were always working on trying to get people interested in that script, invest in it, get the actors on side, put all the pieces together to make it happen. And then finally, you know, 10 years after their initial idea, it's a film that we see. If it wasn't for, pers for persistence, they'd give up. And we wouldn't have some of the great art we do have. You know, and if you're confident in your vision, whatever it might be, you just follow through. And I think it's that s the sweat of follow through separates a lot of people. Starting Borealis. You know, it, it, I did another record of my own music and I had been on Stan Rogers' label and when he died, of course, there was no label, really. His own music is being kept there by his wife, but expanding it as he was doing just stopped. So I had nobody who was going to indulge me and put the music out for somebody who doesn't play full time. And I was going to US labels and they said, well, we know your music, we like it. If you want to wait two years, maybe we could release it. but." Why don't you go to somebody in Canada? There was nobody. Not in, sort of in solidly in the folk world at the time. So I thought, well, wait a minute. Why don't I get some of my friends together? And instead of me taking $5,000 from my line of credit and producing this my record, why don't a bunch of us take five grand and throw it in the pot and start something bigger? And that's how it began, you know. Um, the Folk Awards, it was seeing a, a need where, uh, where the Junos just weren't answering our community. You know, the Junos roots and traditional categories had too much variety in them. You were apples and bananas were competing against each other and it made no sense, you know. Uh, you know, uh, Bruce Coburn's new record against a, a traditional Quebecois band. They're equally deserving. They, it makes no sense that they're fighting each other for the same category. The reason I could even have that thought is a habit of thought that you can accomplish things. 